very happy to be here on Uncle Daily. Uh, we're very uh, privileged and honored to have uh, one of the international leaders uh, for uh, clinical studies and uh, Giuseppe Curliano. Uh, welcome. Uh, great to see you again. Good morning. Good morning. It's really my pleasure to be with you today. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things that I love about ASCO and ESMO meetings is just meeting up with our mentors and, and also like the people that have influenced us. And, you know, I've been very fortunate to be mentored by Dr. Jamie Abraham, uh, as you know, the, the chair of a Cleveland Clinic and also a world renowned breast cancer oncologist. And so um, I know that's something that's, that's very impactful for you, Giuseppe. Uh, you know, Paolo Tarantino, one of my good friends always talks highly about the mentorship that you've given him and all the people that you work with. So what's it been like as a, as a leader in the field and, and mentorship and helping the young uh, oncologists? I believe that investing in young oncologists means primarily to guarantee a future in the field of oncology. So, you know, I had the opportunity in the last 10 years to work with beautiful minds like Paolo Tarantino, Dario Trapani, Stefania Morganti, Chiara Corti, Carmine Valenza. So these are beautiful people that uh, if you support them, they will support you because finally they have uh, original ideas. They can see the world in a different way. Uh, they can see the future. So I rely on their capability to see the future and that's why I mentor and sponsor them because uh, if you support them, they will support you. Don't forget that in the future, we will have a shortage of medical oncologists. So it's really important to have a young generation of people with a lot of passion, with a lot of commitment for cancer care and beautiful idea to develop new clinical trials. They are the future. This is the only thing I can say. And any one of us has the responsibility to support and to sponsor them. Oh, I could agree more. You know, I, I, when I was a fellow, um, just to kind of learn from the various attendings and, you know, you, you feel like an undifferentiated cell. You know, you're around somebody, you get stimulated and you get this passion for research. And, you know, I, I'm just so fortunate to have that mentorship. And and I know you're running for the ESMO president and I looked over, you know, your mission statement and just the, the passion and, and the love that you have for like the the younger oncologists and how they're going to start taking over and, and helping out with clinical trials and patient care. And so what are your thoughts about that? Because that really resonated with me, like your mission as a, uh, for the ESMO president elect. You know, my idea is to build a strong mentorship and sponsorship program for young investigators. The general idea is to be committed to support financially them, because this is really important. Many of them decide to do fellowship outside Europe and to come to the United States. We need to support these people. Don't forget that the best way to be transformative in clinical oncology is first to be really innovative in the ideas. But secondly, is to stay in a permissive environment. And the majority of the talent that we have usually cannot explode because there is no permissive environment. Permissive environment means first, guarantee a support from the economical point of view. Secondly, give the space to express yourself. And third, don't stop their ideas. So support and give them a permissive environment. I just love that comment about don't stop their ideas because you know, as a leader in the field, you know, you have so much information, uh, you know, like, for example, like your study on the Destiny Breast 06 and the Destiny Breast 03. And, and, and so, but, you know, the up and comers, they have their own research ideas and eventually they're going to go on their own and cast their own shadow. So I, I love the fact that you're so open-minded. Uh, this is really important. Don't forget the majority of the Nobel Prize uh, conceived their Nobel Prize idea where, when they were under 30. So <laughs> this should, this should be considered. So you have to take seriously any proposal coming from people under 30 because they can be really transformative, in my opinion. You know, speaking of which, you know, I, I really love get to know like a patient's journey uh, when they became, you know, a, a world learning leader in, in medical oncology. And can you kind of share with the audience uh, what it was like when you when you were like uh, decided to become a medical oncologist and and your story uh, to where you are now? 
Oh, yes, of course. You know, as you know, I was born in Canada from Italian immigrants, and uh, I stayed in Toronto or in the neighborhood of Toronto until 10 years old. And then I came back to the south of Italy, of course, that is completely different from the city where I live now. I live in Milano. You know, so I decided first uh, to start studying uh, a philology because I was really impressive about the power of the words of literature. But after one year, I realized that that, that that was not my mission. And so I entered the medical school. I studied in Rome. And then my commitment was to do cancer. But when I graduated, there was no medical oncologist in Italy. And all oh, wow. over Europe. Yes, because medical oncologist was not a profession. Medical oncology, cancer doctors were gastroenterologists working in colorectal cancer or gynecologists working on ovarian and gynecological cancer. That's why ESMO did the most important thing, because ESMO is the European Society for Medical Oncology and contributed to the creation of the figure of medical oncologists in Europe. Now, if we have now a residency school in my country, is also thanks to ESMO. So there was no residency school and I moved in the United States. So I have been uh, for a short period in Charleston, South Carolina. That is a beautiful place. Beautiful city by the beach. It's a beautiful place. And over there, I worked on flow cytometry and immunophenotyping of solid tumors. And then I moved to New York. That was the most beautiful experience in my life. I was in the Columbia University, Columbia Comprehensive Cancer Center, the Herbert Irving Comprehensive Cancer Center, working with Regina Santella and Isaac Bernard Weinstein, that is the father of the concept of oncogene addiction. And it was a beautiful experience in my life. I believe the best experience in my life. Then I came back in Italy. And uh, I started working where I am now in the European Institute of Oncology in Milano that at the beginning was a short cancer center. Now it's the largest comprehensive cancer center in Italy. And uh, it's a place uh, where you have a lot of young people, since I am professor of medicine at University of Milano, and you can realize uh, a lot of dreams. Well, I think it's great. You know, I, I think one thing I just listening to your story is, you have such a wealth of experience and not just with different people and, but just different cities. And, you know, some people consider New York city, like the melting pot of the world. And so you have so many cultures there. You were at Columbia, you, you, you got your feet there and then you started working on up and learn from all the different people uh, to the point where you are, you're like an international leader in, in breast cancer and, and, in, in, in research. So I think it's a phenomenal story. Thank you, thank you. It's just an history of any one of us have experience like this. Personally, I believe that any place I visited gave to me something. Now, based on your background, you also have a wealth of experience because for me, it's not just about just doing a lot of research, but you have a lot of experience in ESMO and all the different leadership positions. So I was wondering if you can kind of highlight some of that for our audience as well. You know, what I did in ESMO in the last 10 years, uh, first, uh, I worked a lot, of course, uh, in the faculty because I am a member of faculty of ESMO since 20 years, since 2004. So I organized several preceptorships all over the world, mainly on breast cancer, but also on precision medicine. I tried, of course, uh, to bring the experience of Europe in medical oncology in many places of the world, like Latin America, like Middle East, uh, like Africa, and also Asia. Asia is a key place of the world also for ESMO. I also covered the role of the chair of the clinical practice guidelines for three years. My mission was to globalize the clinical practice guidelines, and that's why I worked a lot on um, including uh, within the authors many people from the United States, from Asia, Latin America, all over the world, because if you have a panel of people from all over the world, these guidelines can be applied everywhere. And finally, I also have been responsible as chair of the nomination committee. The commitment and the responsibility of this committee is really critical for any society because these are the people selecting the next presidents. And at the end of my experience, uh, I, I moved uh, as editor-in-chief of ESMO Open. That is a, a very young journal. 
outstanding journal, I believe very innovative with an, uh, an outstanding panel of associate editors, so including people from United States and Asia. And uh, actually, this is my commitment, and I believe this will be a fantastic journal in the next years. Uh, today, uh, I, I read uh, on, uh, on Clarivate that site score of ESMO Open increased again, so we expect in the future to have really a beautiful journal with a lot of scientific insights, uh, attracting many, many good papers. Yeah, just listening to that, I could just sense this... Uh passion and, and just love for, you know, just, just clinical practice and research. I mean, to be help out with the ESMO guidelines. And that's something that I even use here in America. I mean, we have, you know, uh, you, you, we have different guidelines such as the NCCN guidelines, but, you know, there's pros and cons of the NCCN guidelines. So I use the ESMO guidelines very often here as well. So I'm, I'm glad you're very impactful and, and also with the precision medicine piece, because it's phenomenal with artificial intelligence and precision medicine and, and tailoring the treatments for our patients. Uh, what are your thoughts about that precision medicine and possible AI uh, helping our uh, oncologists in, in our careers and our patients? In ESMO, there are two working groups. One is the precision medicine working group that generated the ESCAT score that has been recently updated. It is a very useful tool in order to evaluate the magnitude of clinical benefit of a specific treatment and the addiction of a specific genetic alteration is the only guidance to provide an information for clinicians on what, what is going to happen if you target that specific alteration. And finally, also, there is a lot of activity within ESMO with artificial intelligence. There is another working group, or ESMO also founded a journal that is, is a ESMO Real World Data that is strictly collected to the use of artificial intelligence, because don't forget that AI is going to replace many eventually fields, uh, also in medical oncology, if you consider the use of AI in pathology or the use of AI in diagnostic and radiology. It's really critical to provide a framework to assess the clinical validity and the clinical utility of the algorithms of AI that we are going to use in clinical practice, because we need to validate them in the clinical practice. And this is a critical point. Oh, I agree. I, I, I think with so much data, I mean, even if you just look at a class of cancers such as ER positive breast cancer, now you're looking at first line for pic 3 ca mutation and using artificial intelligence and precision medicine. I mean, it's just phenomenal, the clinical research that's occurring, not just in oncology, but subspecialty into breast oncology and ER positive breast cancer. It's, the amount of information is just a lot right now. So I think AI and precision medicine will really help us.